So your specialty is pediatrics. For kids, when they breathe in that smoke, is the effect worse? Does it take longer to kick in? Are there different ways that their bodies work as they're developing that react to wildfire smoke? Yeah, really good question. So kids are definitely more sensitive to environmental exposures in general and wildfire smoke specifically. I like to sort of sum that up uh, as three different things. So one, kids breathe more air and that also means they breathe more pollution relative to their size than adults do. And so it means that they're getting essentially a higher dose of air pollution, right? If my daughter and I are in the same space, she's gonna get a higher dose of pollution than I am. Kids also spend more time exercising and more time outdoors. And that's a good thing, right? We want kids running around and playing. Um, that's much better than me sitting here at a desk. Um, but because of that, it means that they're also gonna get more exposure. And then the third, as you mentioned, kids are still growing and developing. And so when kids have toxic exposures that can um, disrupt growth, you can then end up having lifelong effects by changing the growth trajectory, changing the way that they're growing and developing. So this isn't something that just is a factor when there's wildfire smoke in our immediate vicinity. This can be, is there something called, uh, such as wildfire induced asthma? Can there be something chronic that develops out of this? So that's a really good question. I think it gets really hard to tease apart because as you know, and as I'm sure everybody watching this knows, you know, we are having many more wildfire events in the last few years than, than we had previously. And so we really don't have great data yet on what it means to have, as you know, my seven-year-old daughter has had multiple smoke days from school every year, right? We just don't have the data on that because we, we haven't had kids that have grown up in those conditions yet. But what we do know is that exposure to these kinds of pollutants in other settings, the same kinds of pollutants that are in wildfire smoke can contribute to long-term asthma risk. So do I think it's it's likely or probable that that, that may be the case, especially as kids are being exposed more and more? I'm, I definitely am concerned about that. Do I have like solid data to show you for that yet? No. Tahoe right now is just maxed out on the air quality scale. Some of the sensors just can't even read it. When it gets that bad, what should parents be thinking about doing other than just maybe getting out of there? Yeah, so I would say at that bad and lower, so basically from the orange and higher, there are three things that I always tell people to know to do. So one is to just know when your air quality is that level, right? When it's really, really bad outside, often folks know. But at the lower level, sometimes people aren't, aren't paying attention as much, don't know sort of when you hit the orange level. The best way to do that is to use airnow.gov, which is probably what you guys also use when you're reporting on it. That's the EPA's webpage. They also have a map if you like being able to see sort of the, the pattern. Um, that's at fire.airnow.gov. Those are more accurate than various third-party sites that are out there that sometimes people point to. So the first is to just know where to look. But the second is to make sure that your indoor air is as clean as it can possibly be. I think oftentimes people overlook that. Certainly keeping out the outdoor air can be helpful, but you also produce pollution inside your home. And our homes aren't sort of saran wrapped, right? It's not perfectly sealed. And so um, even if you close your windows and doors and all that kind of stuff, there's still going to be smoke getting in. So what you want to make sure that you're doing is filtering the air as well as you can. If you have an HVAC system that's using a MERV 13 filter or higher, that's M-E-R-V, minimum efficiency rating value is what it stands for. Um, MERV 13 filter or higher, that'll filter out most of the particles. And you want to make sure that your HVAC is running enough that you're pushing the air through the filter. Um, if you don't have an HVAC system, you can get portable air cleaners. You want to make sure for portable air cleaners that you're using ones with a high enough CADR, apologies for all the acronyms, that's clean air delivery rate. Uh, and what you want to check is that your clean air delivery rate has enough to clean the whole volume of the space you're trying to clean two or three times per hour. So you'd have to actually sort of calculate the square footage and the height of your room, figure out what that volume of air is. And you want that moving through two or three times per hour. You also wanna make sure that those portable air cleaners are mechanical ones, ones using a, a filter, a HEPA style, fil style filter, not electronic ones. So the electronic ones can produce ozone, which also has bad health effects and can also produce ions, which we're starting to realize also have health effects. And so you really want to focus on the mechanical filter based ones that we know work really well. The reason I, I sort of backtracked and said you can do that at low pollution levels and high pollution levels is that those actually work very well. And so you can get your indoor air quality into the green or yellow range 
even on an unhealthy or very unhealthy day outdoors by taking those kinds of um, actions to make sure you have a plan to have a clean indoor air space. The third thing that people can do um, is to have masks that can provide some protection from wildfire smoke if they have to be outdoors, right? So certainly if, if you can be in a cleaner indoor air space, that's a great thing to do. And it's a great way to have one intervention that can help protect your whole family. But, you know, you have to take your child to school or out to a doctor's appointment or whatever it is. Um, so the best kind of mask for people to wear um, is actually what most scientists would not call a mask at all. Um, it's a respirator, and that's those NIOSH certified N95 respirators that people have been hearing about, or, or what sometimes people will call an N95 mask. Um, those will provide some protection from COVID, but they also provide good protection from wildfire smoke. We expect somewhere in the range of about an 80% decrease in the exposure that you get from wildfire smoke if you're wearing one of those masks. Certainly that depends on how good the fit is, right? So you'll have better protection, the better it fits your face. We've seen some data that when there's greater concentrations of wildfire smoke, the, the rate at which COVID is spread in a community goes up specifically for kids. Is that more of a concern for kids under 12 because they can't be vaccinated, but is there anything about their biology that makes them more likely to be infected with COVID when there's a greater concentration of wildfire smoke? Well, so as we talked about before, kids are more likely to get uh, a higher dose of wildfire smoke exposure, even exposed to the same sort of milieu, the same setting as an adult. Um, the reason that we uh, expect that there's an increase in COVID rates related to wildfire smoke exposure is because you get that inflammation we talked about earlier. Your lungs get irritated and then they're more likely to be able to be infected. That's the case for COVID. It's also the case for other infections, things like influenza. We have really good data for that as well. Um, I think it's also a risk for children, maybe slightly more of a risk, but that might be balanced by the fact that kids are getting less severe COVID than adults sort of in very general terms. So it's a little hard to know for a new illness like COVID. Okay, Dr. Stephanie Holm with UCSF, thank you very much for your time and sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me.